Blog Talk Radio. <laughs> Chatting with Nat is a podcast for independent women seeking to speak their truth and to break down barriers. We host honest conversations that help to guide and empower women. Speak your truth and set yourself free. Let your voice be heard. with Nat. Yes, it's Natalie Jean. It's Natalie Jean. Today we have singer-songwriter Lisa Jeanette. Jellyfish on the Moon is singer-songwriter Lisa Jeanette's second album, which has charted at number four on that FAI folk DJ chart for March 2021. A Philadelphia native, she earned a Bachelor of Music and Performance from Temple University. Annette has been finding her voice and honing her songwriting skills while being mentored by Vance Gilbert and attending Ellis Paul's songwriting retreats. Lisa is a multi-instrumentalist and accompanies her stuff on guitar, piano, and sometimes a harpsicle. So let's give Lisa a round of applause. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Natalie. How are you? I'm good. I wanted to make sure that you, you felt warm and and loved with that applause. I, I love the applause button. That applause is just like, warm me up. That was awesome. That's probably <laughs> the most people that have ever clapped for me. <laughs> well, me too. Is there applauding for you? They're applauding for me. I love it because you didn't want to just hear my hands clap. And, you know, in these podcasts, I'm like, that's just not going to work anymore. Let me see if I can find an applause thing. Maybe I should find some cat calling too. Some some of those things go woohoo! Yeah, hey, maybe like the like a ballpark sound like. Oh, <laughs> oh I like that. You know what? Um, let me write that down because you just gave me. <laughs> I love that. Maybe I can graduate for that. Maybe in five years I'll I'll be worthy of a ballpark sound. <laughs> Worthy of the ballpark sound now. Um, I had a great time with you on Instagram Live. Um, yeah. One thing we got to to tell you is you have an awesome, great smile. Like your smile is very infectious. I was I watching you. Instagram Live and I'm like, oh my god, she's so bubbly and so sweet and so cute. Um, <laughs> and, she, and she's great at what she does. I can Thank compliment. You so much. I don't have a problem complimenting other women. Some people are like, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I don't care. No, um, no. I, I'll take it wherever I can get it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Let, you're welcome. Let's begin, shall we? Um, what's one thing you wish you had known when you began your career? Um. Hmm. Oh. Uh, more people. <laughs> I wish I had known more people. Because, uh, you know, every business is a relationship business. Mm-hmm. And the more people you know. So so I have a story. So when I was a singer-songwriter back in the 90s, I, I had a hiatus. Like I was – in the back in the 90s, I was a singer-songwriter. I, I, life happened. I took a lot of time off and didn't write songs. I, I didn't take time off. I just wasn't inspired. Didn't write songs for 20 years. Then I married my husband – and I really married him for the baby grand piano he owned, and I tell him that all the time. <laughs> and when I moved in with this baby grand piano, I started writing. So, you know, it, uh, it, that's kind of what happened. Like, I, you know, it was after this long time of not writing, the piano just inspired me. And then he was like, oh, we got to record this stuff. So we did the first album in, in our basement. And then <clears throat> the second album we did at Morning Star Studios with Glenn Barrett. But I was going to say, so when I was a singer-songwriter back in the 90s, there was a, a time where I, I was at some place, I think it was in New Hope, Pennsylvania, uh, and it was an open mic, and Gene Shea showed up. And Gene Shea in the Philadelphia area is like the folk god. He just he, he passed away from COVID, actually, last year. But he he was like the person to know, and, and he was there, and I was too shy to even talk to him, and I I didn't even try to talk to him, and everybody else was going up and talking to him, and I just kind of like was a wallflower, <laughs> and if I would have known then, 
that relationships are everything and that you have to meet as many people as you can and, you know, make friends and, and build relationships, I I would have I wish I would have known more people is my answer. <laughs> you know what? That's a phenomenal answer. Because Thank I you. agree with you and this business is great when you know people. I mean it doesn't even yeah. have to be higher ups, it could just be another musician. It could be exactly. another person do, uh, on the same path that you are. I think the more we have in common, the more people we meet is, you know, more resources that we have in, in building a foundation. So I think that's an awesome, awesome answer. So um, have you always been interested in music? Yes, yes. I, um, from the time I – so I, I went to a, a church, and I would walk by the organ. There was, like, an organ with the pedals and everything else, and that's what I wanted to do, like, because that was – I think in a lot of people's lives, the first experience you have with live music might be in a church or a synagogue. Like if you're a kid, you're not going to con- – unless you're like you have really cool parents that drag you to festivals and concerts. <laughs> Your first experience, at least when I was growing up, with live music was at the church. So I wanted to, I wanted to play organ. They told me I had to learn piano if I, if I wanted to play organ, so I took piano lessons. Um, and we were poor. My sister actually paid for my lessons. She was already um, working and out of the house. So, you know, I, I took piano lessons, and then I took organ lessons, and then I took bass in high school, and then it just, you know, kept exploding. But, yeah, I always – oh, and then, you know, I, I always say in my bio that I timeshare my brother's guitars when I was growing up because mm-hmm. they had – my brothers had guitars, and I would, you know, while they were at work, I would steal away and, and <laughs> grab their guitars until they got home, and I'd give them back. So, yeah, I was always interested and always drawn to music. I love that. Um, of your own music, which song is your favorite and why? It changes a lot. Um, <laughs> it changes a lot. Uh, and it's for different reasons. You know, each one is for different reasons. And, you know, I've heard other songwriters say it's like your children, you don't want to pick one and that sort right. of thing. But right now, because of the recording, the recordings kind of brought out some things in the songs that I, I could never have imagined on my own. It was the musicians that were involved, which were uh, Ross Bellinois was a guitarist, and um, Chico Huff was a bass player, and Eric Johnson was a drummer, and they were just amazing. And they brought out some things in these songs, along with you know Glenn Barrett producing it, that on my own I would have never imagined. So one of those songs was um, Skyfall. Uh, or I'm sorry, it's not called Skyfall. It's called Sky Don't Fall. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, it's called Sky Don't Fall. So that one, I up until I went into the studio, I would play that one really fast and driving hard guitar. And when we got in there into the studio, Glenn Barrett was like, you know, what do you think about doing this like a James Taylor soft guitar sort of thing? And I, I was open to anything. I'm like, sure, let's try it. And then I sang the song and they played it. And at the end of the song, I said, wow, this is a sad song. <laughs> like, I had no idea how sad it was till it slowed down. And, you know, so that, that I love that song. I love uh, um, You Don't Look My Way. I, I love that for, I wrote it really well in my range, so I sing it well. Like, I, I, that wasn't purposeful. It just happened. And um, so that, and it's a little jazzish. So, you know, I, I like it for that. Never been to war. I love the the production on that. It's uh, and, and that's out of my comfort zone because it. I was trying to get my bat, Pat Benatar out in that song because I, I tend to not sing like a like a rock kind of voice. So, uh, that was a challenge. So for different reasons, I I like different songs. I mean, I love all of them, but they're all my children. <laughs> no, I mean our music. Are, oh, yeah, those are our baby. We put our life and soul. And our, all of our energy into our songs. Yeah, no, you, you, yeah, you got to you gotta cradle it. You got to love it. Um, have you ever written any songs for uh, other artists? Um, not intentionally, but uh, Don't Blame Me, Jolene's Reply. I hope another artist wants to sing it, so like, you know, like a more famous artist, of, like in the country world. I, like I would love if that happened, um, you know. That's my hope, but it wasn't. In- it's never intentional to write. You know, like, like my one song, um, "For You and I," I wrote to be like a Carol King song because mm. it was in my it was in my mood. 
Um, but it's not like I wrote it because I think Carol King should sing it. It's more just like, oh, I, this feels like Carol King, you know, sort of like that. Um, I think you should release this the Jolene song. I mean, that? I think you should release it. I mean, I know it's on your, I know it's on your album, but I really think yeah. you should put that song because when you were playing it, I mean, it's an amazing song. One, that's number one, and I think that. A lot of people will gravitate to the to, to that song because it, it is a Dolly Parton. Uh, you're, you're talking to Dolly Parton and stuff like that, and she's a huge icon, and people just love her. Um, yeah. you, should, you, know, you don't you don't have an, a video with it, do you, for that particular song? I don't. I have a video of me singing it at a festival, but I don't have like a like a formal video. But you don't need a formal video because what I'm like what I'm thinking because I you know I saw that. I know that you saw that I posted it on a clip of it on TikTok, and mm-hmm. just doing that, it got, I think it got 120 or more views on there. Um, wow. Because I, because what I did is I hashtag Dolly Parton. I oh, I've been doing it all wrong. <laughs> yes, I've become the queen of hashtagging. Let me tell you something. When I first started this musical journey, well, not when I first started, but maybe about four or five years back here. I didn't understand this whole hashtagging thing. Oh, now I am the queen now. And um That's awesome. Yeah, so I had to learn to do that. And for you I think oh. that if you did like a, another video where you're playing not in a festival setting, but like you were playing on, on IG Live and you, you yeah. hashtagged it to death. Uh, you put it on YouTube, you put it on Instagram, TikTok, with pin, Pinterest you put it everywhere, I think it would be a hit. I seriously do. Somebody else may gravitate to it and say, oh, my God, I want to do this. I want to release it. And then you, you, you tag Dolly Parton all over the place. And I'm telling you. That is such a great idea. I didn't even think of that. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a kind of a slacking TikToker. I, <laughs> I'm like, I, I put some two, like, silly videos up there, and then I sort of got away from it. But I see you're using it really well, and, and it's you're inspiring me. <laughs> I try, listen, I, try, oh my God, it was a, it was because of beast word management, you know, they're like, oh, Natalie, you need to get on TikTok, and I'm like, oh my God, do I really have to do that stuff, and then I realized yeah. that I could do my, I do my own music, and, you know, I put my kittens on there to be funny and stuff like that, but it is a good yeah. tool to get people to know your music, in fact, I Google myself on, on the daily just to see what what's happening, and I, I Google some of my songs on, uh, for TikTok, and there are people that have actually used my songs on TikTok, which I was very shocked to see. So wow, yeah, yeah so definitely, yeah, think up, think up, uh, think up a video, it, it, and it's just you playing, and it's just yep. you saying, you know, I decided to write this song because that's why blah blah blah, and then you just perform the song and hashtag it to death and see what happens because I've noticed uh, when I have a friend, he's, well, I've known this boy since he was, I don't know, 11, 12. <laughs> now he's like 16, 18. I don't know when it makes me feel old. But anyway, he did a, he did a song like what you did with uh, Jolene for okay. another song. I can't remember. And the artist herself contacted him. Wow. <laughs> that's and cool. Yeah, yeah. And that's all because he posted it everywhere. People shared it. Um, yeah, so if you decide to do something, you know, sh- send me a clip. I'll hashtag it to death. Make sure I share it everywhere. Let Dolly Parton know. There's Thank a woman you. Yeah, that's awesome. Doing it. I think she would like the song. I think she would. No, I, I think so, too. That's why I'm telling you, let, do it. You just never know. <laughs> you gotta, yeah, you gotta do it. Um, what, what are your ambitions as a songwriter and musician? So as a songwriter, I just want to get better. Like, I, you know, I, I, I coach with Vance Gilbert. Um, I've been coaching with him for about two and a half years. And I just want to get better at the craft. I, I didn't really understand that it even was a craft until I met him. And I, I didn't even understand that there's a, such a thing called editing. Like, to me, I would just write the song and I'd be done. And I, sometimes I'd write it in one sitting and I'd be done with it. Right. And he's kind of taught me, take a second look. Like, you know, maybe you can improve on something. <laughs> so 
<laughs> at first I was very resistant to that thought because I thought, right. it's done, you know, like, I'm done with it. I wrote it in an hour. Like, and then I think, like, well, what's so great about writing something in an hour if you can make it right. better if you get it two days later or, or whatever. So I've really learned the craft is in the editing, and I've really took my – leveled up my songwriting since I've been studying with him, uh, getting some – lyric coaching he's also a performance coach so i've he's really yeah. helped me with my performance as well so that that's been incredible and then on the on the instrument side i just wish i were better at everything i i, I took a guitar lesson from the guitarist on the album ross belenois and i and i want to take some more because he's just amazing and i didn't play guitar at all on the album he did all, he and glenn barrett did all the guitar and i did play piano but i you know to me i was like they have these really, really great guitars. Why should I play? <laughs> but I, you know, I, I want to get better when I perform, and and that's why I took a lesson from him because of that song, "I Don't Fall." Uh, mm-hmm. I couldn't play it the way he played it, so I had to take a lesson. And then he told me what he did. I'm like, oh, okay, now I can play it because I was really struggling. But yeah, so I, I I want to get better at both things, songwriting and and being an instrumentalist. Awesome sauce. All right, so we're going to play Don't Blame Me right now. Hold on one second. We'll have a word from our sponsor. Hi, it's Jordan and Madison, and we're Jay Madison out of Nashville, Tennessee. We'd love to tell you about B-Squared Management, artist services by artists for artists. Get your press, branding, single release, and sync success plan now at bsquaredmgmt.com. And listen up to our latest single, Down, now on Spotify.
I'm going to phrase this every time I try to phrase this. Okay. What is something that you tried to do in your music career, but it didn't happen? And what did you learn from it? Oh, wow. So I started out wanting to be, well, I started out wanting to be an organist. (laughs) Then I wanted to be a concert pianist. Then I wanted to be a double bass player in an orchestra, like the Philadelphia Orchestra where I grew up. And uh, that was one I invested a lot in because I went to college for it. And then, um, and I'm going to be really, uh, um, I usually don't tell this story, but I'm going to tell you why I stopped writing. So um, I went to college to take double bass. I, um, you know, started to, after college, that's when I started to song right after college, but then I started gigging, gigging at some local symphonies, like minor league kind of six, symphonies and making some money and playing little, you know, concerts and stuff. Right. There wasn't a lot of money. I was living with my mom, thank God. But then um, my father was shot in a bar robbery. And so this was like in 1994. And I that changed my world because I loved the life of um, being spontaneous and not knowing where your next you know, check is coming from or, ha- you know, if you're going to make it through the month, you, you know, with your expenses or having the, you know, you either have a drought or, you know, a flood with a, with money when you're a freelance musician. Like there's some really tight months and some, some where you don't make any money and then others where you're, you know, flowing in it. But having someone get shot in your family, like your father, uh, it made me – want to have um, routine in my life, and I, I needed to know what was coming next because that was something I would never imagine happening. Right. And it was kind of like, I mean, and, and, you know, so this happens, this happens all the time right now to young black men and their families, and I sympathize with that because when that happens, and I'm a white girl. Like I, I, this wasn't. This isn't even a racial thing. This he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. But you know, I when that happens, it, it just your family feels just horrible. And and then news happens. Like so, the local news um, paper kind of portrayed my father like a bum, and that he was that he was over a five dollar bill in the bar. Like made up, fabricated this whole story. And this is back, you know, in the nineties. So, and it was hard to, like, you know, find my father being portrayed like he was, like, a bum and, and like, a, not a good person when he raised nine kids. He worked every day. Um, he was an alcoholic, but he was a functioning alcoholic, and he went to work every day and supported, you know, nine children. So, and and he was a war, he was in the, I mean, he was in, he was a veteran. So, um, you know, to see that, so then, so I understand that feeling of a family member, and, and I'm not saying it's the same. I'm just saying on one level, that is horrific. You know, right. when it's racially motivated, that's a whole other, that's a whole other book, you know, like we're not even in the same church, well, in the same pew. But, you know, it's, uh, that just, thought, and so I went and got like a day job, and then I've had a day job ever since because, I started to get used to having regular money, and and then I started, you know, getting better at those sort of skills and those sort of things. So I sort of didn't do music for like 20 years, and I still had a church job. I always had a church job. I still do, where I play music for church. But I um, didn't do any songwriting at all. I mean, there was one job I had where I would write parodies for everybody's birthday, and that was fun. But (laughs) But I wasn't writing at all. So life happened, and... You know, that's kind of, I don't even remember what your question was, but <laughs> it didn't work out. You know, you asked me if it didn't work out, like one thing that didn't work out. The double bass didn't work out, and it was, but what I learned from it was, so, you know, when I told people I wasn't playing bass anymore, like my family, like my one sister was like, you can't give that up. You put all that, you put all that effort into that. You, you know, you, all that investment you made, you can't just give it up. 
and at the time, I I was like, I'm giving it up. Like, I, I was just in a bad way. I was very yeah. depressed. And, and um, you know, I learned, because now I play in a community orchestra and for fun. And I learned that there is a difference playing music for money and, and playing music for fun. Um, there are a lot of really wonderful musicians just playing for fun, like as Joni Mitchell says, playing for free. Um, uh, so it's that kind of opened up, um, kind of put my snobbery about being a good player down a few pegs because <laughs> if I had the snobbery, which I'm sure I did, um, because, I, you know, now it's like I'm not the best bass player. In fact, you know, I don't hardly ever practice. And when I do, when I do, it's good. But when I don't, you know, I'm playing in the orchestra and I'm hoping they put me in the back so nobody can hear me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I learned, I learned that every musician, every musician is doing it out of their heart. Um, you know, nobody goes to a community orchestra after working all day as a teacher. Most of them are like teachers or doctors or whatever, like, the, you know, a lot of schools, uh, high school kids that went to school uh, or college kids go to mm-hmm. play in community orchestras, and um, they're all doing it out of love, you know, it's like, and, and the people that don't go to open mics that really aren't, they're not songwriters, they're playing other people, other people's songs, and they, you know, they, they don't have, you know, big dreams about being something, but they're singing out of their heart and I and I think I've learned that over the years that you know everyone that does music is is valuable and and worthy and um we every you know I I need to listen to and I need to learn from them no I I agree with you there's so many things that we can learn from other people um what would you say is your biggest musical challenge now money (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I am not like struggling at all. I you know I have a good job and you know I, I'm fine, but I would love to start on another album right now. <laughs> and you know, an album costs like you know just to get the album done ten thousand dollars in in the way I did the last one with the musicians that we hired and, and the studio time I had and the producer I had, you know, and then and then you still have to pay for mailing it and everything. I mean, I'm sure I spent like fifteen or $20,000 on this album um, by the time it's all said and done. And, and it's, an, it's, a, it's a very expensive hobby for me right now because I'm not making a living from it. Um, but, yeah, money is, is – t- and I don't think people realize, like you know, I don't think the people realize how much it costs <laughs> to do an album. Like, it's just a lot. It's, it's, especially if you're using live musicians. Like, I'm lucky in the sense that, you know, my music producer, Alexi von Krugenberg, he does everything, does the mastering. He, he, he harmonizes for me. He's the producer. He just does. He's an all-in-one. He, he's oh, that's cool. amazing. So I don't have yeah. to... I, you don't have to rely on live uh, musicians, although I would love to do one a uh, live album eventually. But uh, yeah, yeah uh, I mean, I know some uh, producers um, that will charge five thousand dollars per song. Do you hear me? Oh per- man! And for me, you know, you have to earn what you think you're worth. But five thousand dollars for a, they'll never find me. They'll never find me. And because um, I'm not doing that. Um, I don't. For me, it's not important who's on the album in the sense of oh my god, this guy is a Grammy person. And he's done this and he's done that. If I can find the individual or individuals that can give me what I need, that's who I want on my album. Because the thing yeah. is, when you can just let a regular Joe Schmo off the street. And he's just an amazing person and an amazing player. You're just like, so what the hell do I need all these other people for? It's great. And it's not that it's not great to have a Grammy Award winning person on your on your album and stuff like that. But there's so many amazing artists out there that have that can just make your album sound so awesome that yeah. why focus on why I have to have this person on my album. I think a lot of pe- people tend to miss out when they just want that particular person on their album. So together, like, together we are stronger. 
<laughs> yeah, that is true. Yeah. That's no, motto. I agree. That's and the motto. In this, for this album, I just let the producer do every, like make all those decisions because I did it myself in the first album, and I found out how bad I am at it. <laughs> So that that was a learning curve. That was where, like, so I had no idea there's something. I, I knew there was something called a session musician or a studio musician, right. but I had no idea what skill they have. And and I have a lot of friends that are amazing musicians, but they've never recorded. But I forced them into that. I'm like, you record for my album, and then it didn't work, and then I felt bad. And you know, and it it you know to me having someone make those decisions for me for right. this time around. It was a was a great thing because I I was like, you know I don't I I need to learn how to do this. It's it's a learning curve that I and I'm not good at it. <laughs> no, I, I get it. I get it. Work. I'm going to play. Um, I am nothing new. Tell me what that's about. So that is about being on both sides of the stage. Like so, you know, inspired by musicians that I've been hanging out with, like Vance Gilbert and Ellis Paul, and going to their concerts and seeing how they're they have mad rabid fans. Like their <laughs> their fans are like just so crazy over them, and and I am too. And then you know, and then you know where, where I am in my life. Um, you know, I'm I'm not like in my teens. <laughs> I'm old, so it's like you know that whole idea of um, catch me now because I'm melting like stubborn snow, uh, clinging to dirt in a mall parking lot. Like that is how I feel. Like I feel like, you know, I, like I am clinging to my dreams, and as long as I can hold on, I am gonna hold on. I love that. All right, let's play the song. Hey, you, with all of your familiars, everyone loves you and all you lay bare. Shrouded with the stars all around you, they enter your orbit and want to stay there. And I want. Go with your try. 
I love that song. I have to tell you, um, that song gives me goosebumps, and it reminds me, and I, and I can't think of the movie I saw it in, but it reminds me of, of a particular song. Oh, you know what? I know what it reminds me of. What is that movie that <laughs> Hugh Jackman and the uh, uh, that musical he just did? Oh, uh, oh, Jesus! <gasps> I hate when oh, I. Oh God! I know. Uh, the Great. <laughs> it's not that tap on my damn tongue. Um, I have to look it up because I I know he did a musical, but I don't think I saw it. Uh, oh, you have to see this musical because it's awesome. Um, but there's a song in there that reminds me, and I, I kept thinking while I was listening to it, this reminds me of um, that particular yeah, I'm song. I'm worried. I'm like, oh, did I write somebody else's <laughs> song? <laughs> the sound of light. Um, um, the Greatest Showman. Oh, so there I will watch that and, and check that out. Have you seen it? I haven't. You should. So there's this song in there where, oh, my God, I can't even remember all the the people are in this damn movie. But the, this woman that plays his wife, she does this, uh, she sings in it. And mm. the melody, I swear the melody is almost identical. The, the part, no, mm, no, mm, mm, that part right there is so similar to that. And it reminds me of the movie. And that's but the way, yeah, it's crazy. You have to see the movie. Or even you so don't that's, even, just, that's, that's just octaves and, and Ellis Paul uses a lot of octaves. So I was kind yeah. of uh, you know, kind of nodding to Ellis Paul with that. <laughs> and you <laughs> she sings a lot of octaves. Okay. You don't even have to watch yeah, you don't even have to watch the movie. Just go on Spotify. Okay, I'll look it up. Yeah, I'll look up that song. And just listen to the song. Listen to the the soundtrack is awesome. Awesome. I mean, wow. I was seeing the soundtrack over and over and over again. That's how great it is. You, you, yeah. And the event, and, yeah, yeah, what's you know, the soundtrack? After me. <laughs> um, what's the soundtrack? You're probably going to want to actually watch the movie. Um, yeah, I probably will. Yeah, I definitely will. And then, you know, I, I, I have a lawyer friend who is a, a music lawyer. Uh, in the business, and he in the music business, and he, uh, I, I, <laughs> I, to, I told him, you know, I hope someday that I'm famous enough that I need you. <laughs> yeah, because you know nobody's gonna sue me for at this point, because you know, but someday. No, no, I mean, listen, I listen to a lot of songs, and believe me, I hear things that from other songs, but it's going to happen. It's like if you, it's the only problem is if you take a song and. It's, literally the same as the other then you have a problem but people yeah can't. yeah because there's because, nothing new under the sun that's for sure right right and there's notes that people same notes that people use all the time um what are the best resources that have helped you along the way again i'll say people like uh, you know i have a lot of musician friends that uh really helped me figure out how to release the second album and you know, my first album, I still have, you know, 200 CDs sitting in a box. I didn't mm-hmm. really know I didn't really know how to get rid of them. And, you know, here you can, for folk musicians, you can go to the FAI website. There's, right. you know, I would have never thought of this, but there's a list of DJs. You can send your music to these DJs. Some of them will take digital, some of them. And you just got to figure all that that out, you know, emailing them, asking them how do you, how do you want to send and all that kind of stuff. So I, it's friends that have helped me resources the best resources are people and and just getting to know as many as you can and and i've been very fortunate to just have really good friends in my life and and, you know in this in this community in the music community um that are willing to share what they've learned and and that's been awesome no i i like that i love that answer um you mentioned the whole aspect of cds i just refuse to do cds anymore um yeah, One, and I get, I get it's it. Expensive. It's expensive. Yeah. And who's, who's using them? You know, the only time I think CDs are worth it is if you're touring, if you're gigging a lot, and you actually take the time to um, sell merch and your CDs at your performances. That's the only time that it's uh, necessary. But if you're not doing that, I mean, I'm just like you. You mentioned you have CDs in boxes. I have CDs. I have CDs yeah. sitting in the house, and I'm just like, 
when a person can just stream or do whatever online, I'm like, well, there's no point to this. And and I'll give you a story. Um, Steve from Journey finally decided to come out with an album. Of, and I was like, oh, my God, I can't wait to get this album. I'm going to purchase it. Now, this sounds really bad. But I was like, oh, I'm going to purchase it. Then I was, and then, then I remembered, wait a minute. I have Spotify. <laughs> I, can, <laughs> I can just stream the song, which is very sad. At the same time, because I could have purchased the album. I'm, uh, streaming is so bad for artists. Um, and it's good for artists if people can get to know who you are. But um, so yeah. that's why I'm like CDs. Uh, and the other thing is, the other reason why people have CDs is that there's people that are extremely old school that if you want to get your um, album or song reviewed, there are still organizations asking for CDs. And I just tell them, look. I can burn you a copy, but I just don't do CDs anymore. It's expensive. It's not worth my time. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to burn? Yeah, it is. It's very expensive. Like, that's why I was saying the thousands of dollars. That, that was part of it. I did run out of CDs this time, and I had to order more, which that was, <laughs> like, a pleasant surprise. But And, and most, a lot of them went to DJs. And so so the, in the folk world, there are still a lot of DJs that want the physical copy. Some of them don't. Some of them, you know, will take digital, but... Right. That's the reason I did it. But, you know, I agree with you. It's starting to be, I don't know, I, I, it's starting to be a, you're right, because, like, when, when you have a concert, sometimes people want to walk away with something. Even right. if they have Spotify, they want to walk away with the CD. They want to they wanna remember the night somehow. Um, right. But for the most part, yeah, you don't really need CDs, if you, especially if you can't afford it. Like, I, and even, like, the idea of doing a whole album, um, you know, it, a lot of people are releasing singles, and then I have one musician friend that's just doing EPs now, and, like, and she can't afford to do ten songs, but she can afford to do five or seven um, in a studio. So, you know, it's I think you got to be creative and, and come up with your own plan. Well, what I've heard recently, because I'm doing this entrepreneurship thing also, and one of the things they keep telling, and I've, all, I've, I've heard this elsewhere, is that people shouldn't do albums anymore unless it's a specific type of genre because what most people are doing now are like you said smaller things like EPs or they're doing singles because the main thing is that what you want to do when you're pushing an album which I've learned over time is that before the album comes out you take one of your best singles off of the album and you push that like no man's land you just push it and so you see that's what I did with Miss Claus that, that was uh, and that I'm telling you that was the best move I ever made is, is putting out Mrs. Claus in December and then or end of November, and then it it hit number one on the on the folk chart for that month uh, song, the most most played song, and uh, and it didn't hurt that I had Vance Gilbert on. He's an icon in the folk world. So, and then you know that helped. The, the DJs had my attention at that point, and then it, so then it was so much easier when I released the album because they they were they were like, oh, I know, I saw that name before. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and. You know, and 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 the, the other thing that people are just so unaware of, they, they think you release the song and then after a year, it's dead. No, it doesn't work that way. You can push a song forever and ever and ever. I know a story about um this man, he had a song and then it was, and then he decided to bring out the song again 50 years later, and it became a hit. There is there is no expiration on music. You know, whatever you for that song or that album or whatever. It will happen for that. <laughs> I yeah. to, I'm going to get a T-shirt made. There's no expiration to music. <laughs> People, I don't know. Um, yeah, and that, you know, like there's like revivals, like the guy that uh, wrote Pink Moon, I can't remember his name, Pink Moon, but that, you know, he died years ago, and that his music is resurfaced, and, you know, he has a fan base, and that was years ago that he put that music out, but all of a sudden it, it has a fan base now. Um, that it probably never had back then, you know. It, it's and that that happens. Uh, there's an artist that I just uh, found, or I was introduced to, Judy Sill, and I, oh my gosh, I love her, but she died in years and years ago. So, um, you know, it's you're right. They don't expire. You never know. Music is always going to be there. Um, uh, <laughs> Well, Lisa, this is the end of our time, but I've had an awesome time. I think you have a wonderful spirit. You are an awesome person. Um, I love your voice. I mean, I love Thank what you, you do. 
definitely do the Dolly Parton thing because I think the song will definitely go far if you keep pushing it and doing a little video of you just forming it and doing a little explanation, blah, 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 attacking Dolly Parton and the rest of the country world um, because that song is awesome. I love your voice on it. It's catchy. It's amazing. Just like you are. So thank you. It was an honor for you to be on the show. Thank you, Natalie. This is awesome. And thank you for all the tips. This is really helpful. I think you helped me more than I helped you. <laughs> no, and you, you just being you is helpful enough for me. Because, for me, you know, <laughs> together we are stronger. <laughs> oh, this is great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. And this is Chatting with Nat. And this was singer-songwriter Lisa Jeanette. And she's awesome. Until next time. Hey all, I'm Natasha Jane. Love your mom. Love your mom. Chatting with Nat is a podcast for independent women seeking to speak their truth and to break down barriers. We host honest conversations that help to guide and empower women. Speak your truth and set yourself free. Let your voice be heard. Love your voice.